the second session of the 2023 Ohio State University Extension Beef Team's Virtual Beef School was broadcast via Zoom on February the 8th. The evening's program focused on improving fertility and getting cows bred. More specifically, to lead off, OSU grad student Alex Christ shared her research during her presentation entitled Presynchronization and Improving Fertility of Beef Cows. Following that, OSU Extension educator Dean Krieger presented on estrus synchronization while utilizing natural service. Listen in here as Garth Ruff introduces Alex Christ and her presentation, Presynchronization and Improving Fertility of Beef Cows, during the first segment of the evening's program. This evening, uh, we're going to focus on reproduction. If you remember in January, we focused more on economics. Um, February, reproduction. March will be more about animal health. Uh, and then April, once again, kind of a roundtable discussion. Um, if you have any questions between now and then, don't hesitate to send those to my email address. That would be rough.72, R-U-F-F.72 at osu.edu, and we can address those questions. Um, there in that April webinar. Uh, so our first speaker tonight is uh, Alex Christ. Alex, a graduate student with Dr. Alvaro uh, Garcia Guerrera. We had Alvaro on uh, webinars before. Uh, if you've attended AI schools, he's helped with those in the past couple of years. And Alex is going to present some of the research that uh, she's done on pre-synchronization and improving fertility to timed AI and beef cows. Um, you know, another tool in the toolbox uh, that we have available to us as far as reproduction goes to beef producers. Uh, so, Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Garth. So, like Garth said, um, I am a graduate student in Dr. Garcia Guerra's lab. And um, for my master's project, I've actually used pre synchronization as our treatments um, for our herds here in Ohio for OSU. So today, that's what I want to talk to you guys about is that pre synchronization treatment and then improving the fertility of time AI in beef cows. I think I need to put so here's a, just a quick outline of my presentation. I'm first actually going to talk about ester synchronization for time AI, uh, what it is, um, how these synchronization protocols work, and then some of the challenges we face with it. And then I'll move in towards pre synchronization. And what that is, and then we'll I'll get into my research that I've done here in Ohio. On um, we'll talk about the objectives, and then our materials, the methods, and results, and the conclusions that we've gotten from that research. So uh, first, when we are trying to synchronize our cattle, we're trying to synchronize that that timing of estrus, um, and in doing so, uh, synchronizing ovulation in our herd. Here's a timeline here of um, when ovulation occurs um, as refer as um, uh, ov when ovulation occurs from heat um, when we see that standing estrus. So, and this is all in hours here too. So we first see that standing uh, has estrus or that heat period where our cow is actually going to stand and be mounted. Um, this lasts about eight to nine hours in our cows. Um, and from that time point, uh, ovulation is going to occur about 24 to 32 hours after we see that. Then after she releases that oocyte, that, that uh, egg within the cow is going to have a fertile period of approximately 12 hours. So then when, so then when we inseminate and uh, when we inseminate our cows, um, that sperm has a lifespan for about 24 hours within our cows. And six of those hours is actually used for that sperm to prepare itself, which is also called cap, uh, capacitation. And this has to occur in order for that sperm to fertilize that egg. So um, that that's also added into that 24 hour uh, lifespan period here. So looking at this timeline, that AM and PM rule uh, makes sense for us. When we see our cows in heat in the morning here, we'll wanna breed them 12 hours later in the afternoon. This will give the sperm enough time to prepare itself and to be able to meet that fertile egg um, to uh, that, that egg that's available, that's viable still to fertilize it. 
So our goal, again, our goal for synchronizing our cows is that synchronize that timing of estrus and ovulation for the time that we actually want to perform AI. So there's lots of different protocols out there. I just kind of picked this up from uh, Select Sire's website. They have lots of different protocols. We have our Select Sync, and then we have our Co-Sync protocols here. Our Select Sync is a little bit more labor intensive where we're gonna breed off of heat, and then we're also going to breed them all uh, during that one day here of AI. Where our Co-Sync, um, our co-sync protocols here, where we're just running our cows to the shoots during these specific times here, and we're going to breed them all at once um, and not off of heat. There's lots of different protocols on this website. Um, I think it's a pretty great one where you can see different protocols for heifers and cows and cows of different breeds as well there. Um, but you can go and pick one that fix that that meets your production um, your production style. So when we're looking at these synchronization protocols, we see these different treatments, these different hormones that we can use to synchronize our cattle. And it's important to understand how these hormones work within our cows and how they, um, and how they can help us synchronize that time of estrus. So here I have a picture of an ovary and a picture of, and it's depicting the stages and the growth of the follicles of, um, that are housed within the ovary and um, to the timing when they're actually gonna ovulate and form that CL here. So we start off here with these uh, primary uh, ovarian follicles. These follicles are going, to them, are going to mature and develop and produce estradiol at the same point, at the same time. Once these uh, follicles grow large enough, they're going to secrete enough estradiol that's going to induce what we call the GnRH surge. That GnRH surge is then going to activate the LH surge, which is going to then induce ovulation here and release that oocyte. So one of the products that we use for these sync protocols is uh, that GnRH, that gonadotropin releasing hormone. And this is going to stimulate ovulation for us. So it's going to actually bypass that, that need for that estradiol and induce ovulation here of these follicles. So once this follicle releases this oocyte, this um, it's going to then um, mer or it's going to then develop the remaining follicles going to develop into a corpus luteum here in this yellow. This corpus luteum is going to produce progesterone. Progesterone is uh, essential for the maintenance of pregnancy for our cattle. That CL is going to stay with her for her entire gestation period and produce progesterone for her to maintain it. It's also going to prevent any further ovulation from occurring while this is uh, while the CL is present. So we actually have um, a, a source of progesterone for these sync protocols. One of them that we use here is that cedar. That cedar is going to be placed within the vagina and it's going to release steady um, a steady concentration of progesterone for the time length that we need for it to be there. But while progesterone is there, However, further follicular development uh, cannot happen in our, um, in our cattle. So if this cow doesn't become pregnant, this CL throughout the estrocyte, through later on the estrous cycle, is then going to regress and um, stop producing progesterone. And this is caused because, and this is due to the release of prostaglandin F2 alpha or PGF is how I'm going to refer to it for the rest of the protocol here, or rest of this presentation here. Um, the uterus is going to release PGF because it's saying essentially I'm empty, there's something in here, there's nothing developing, and it's going to induce the regression of that CO. So we have PGF for our protocols here that you probably saw from the, the previous slide. Um, it's going to cause a regression of that CL and allow for further follicular development uh, within these uh, for these protocols. So when we look at the estrous cycle in its entirety, um, it's important to understand like what what events are happening um, to understand why we're how we how synchronization protocols work. Um, so this timeline here is relative to ovulation, the day of ovulation here. So this star up here is going to refer to that follicle ovulating. 
and then we have that CL form. In the gray here is going to depict the concentration of progesterone throughout the estrous cycle. And then the red line is going to um, indicate the, uh, the levels of estradiol within this uh, estrous cycle. So once ovulation occurs, we have that CL form, and then we have the first follicle wave develop. We have emergence of these follicles here, and they're going to start secreting uh, estradiol. You see how it's going to increase in um, concentration in the beginning here. Because cattle are monoovulatory species, only one follicle is going to be selected for uh, dominancy, will become the dominant follicle, and that one is, is going to cause the other follicles to regress and die off. So as it's uh, increasing uh, and maturing, it's going to be producing more and more estradiol. But because progesterone is in high uh, concentration within our cow right now, that uh, dominant follicle is actually going to go atretic uh, because ovulation, uh, because progesterone is there, it's not going to allow ovulation to happen. So this follicle is going to die off. And once that follicle dies off, it's actually going to then um, uh, allow for a new wave to begin in our cows. And this will be here depicted by the second wave here, where we, again, we have the emergence of those follicles. And then we have one follicle selected for dominancy, and it's going to continue to grow and uh, secrete more and more estradiol. However, because this is the end of our estrous cycle, it's coming towards the end, you can see that progesterone is dropping and uh, that PGF is going to be released during this point. So as progesterone is dropping, that follicle is then going to be able to develop further and produce enough estradiol to induce that GnRH LH surge and allow for ovulation to happen. So it's important when we are synchronizing our cattle, this is the point of where towards the end of this estrogen cycle where we have high estradiol and low progesterone is the environment that we're trying to reach in our cattle when we're synchronizing them. So when we do perform AI, it's the right environment for fertilization to occur. So when we look at these sync protocols after understanding the, the hormones that are associated with it and the estrous cycle, I just kind of want to go with you over with you guys like the entire sync protocol um, and how these hormones work throughout the year and how these hormones work for us to synchronize estrus. So that first day we put the cedar in and then we give her that shot, that initial shot of GnRH. That initial shot of GnRH is going to synchronize that follicle growth, that new wave for us. And that cedar that's placed in is going to prevent ovulation from occurring. On our sixth day of our protocol here, we're going to release, we're going to take out the cedar and then give her again that shot of uh, PGF. That PGF is going to regress that CL if it has, if it had form from that first generate shot. Um, and, it, and that removal of that cedar is going to take away the progesterone concentration within our cow. So when we do come to our day of AI, hopefully our cows have low progesterone and high estradiol. And then on day zero here, uh, on the day of AI, we're going to give her again that another shot of GnRH, and we're going to uh, perform uh, AI. This second shot of GnRH is essentially going to hopefully, hopefully clean up any cows that hadn't ovulated prior to time of AI um, and still allow for enough time for that sperm to meet that fertile, um, that egg while it's still in that fertile state for us. So what if we don't synchronize estrus? And what if we just bring in our cows in on any day of the estrus cycle and we just try to breed them? We first see um, Jessica, she kind of comes brought in here to us on day one and day three of the estrus cycle. So on this day here, we have progesterone is increasing in concentration and estradiol is also increasing as well. But these follicles are just emerging and are, they have just, just started to reach that dominant follicle stage. And this is not the right environment for us for our cows to become pregnant. So Jessica is not going to become pregnant. Next, we have Natalia here. Natalia is going to be brought in on day four to day nine 
Again, progesterone is going to be really high because that CL and estradiol is going to be low. Now, it is a dominant follicle established at this point, but Natalia is not going to become pregnant. And then we have Anna here. Anna is coming on this day 10 to day 13. We either have the emergence of those follicles or that dominant follicle here is going to be going neutritic. Progesterone, again, is still high at this point, and estradiol is low, and Anna is not going to be able to become pregnant this day. And then we have Daisy. Daisy's coming at day 14 to day 19 of the estrus cycle, where we have progesterone is still high in the beginning, the majority of this cycle, and estradiol is increasing. Um, we do have a dominant follicle established here, but she's nowhere near uh, in time for ovulation to occur. So she unfortunately is not going to become pregnant. And then we have Maya. She comes brought in on day 20 to day zero. She's either going to be uh, at the onset of estrus or in estrus, or she's going to have be or have ovulated at this point. Um, this would be the prime time for us to bring our cow in and get pregnant or become pregnant to AI at this point. So what if we do synchronize our cows? Essentially, if we do synchronize our cows, we're, we're increasing the proportion of our animals, of our cows that are going to be in that right environment to for fertilization to happen, where it's gonna be low progesterone, high estradiol, and that dominant follicle is mature enough for ovulation to occur. So when we synchronize with estrus for time AI, again, we're synchronizing estrus and we're synchronizing the, fo the follicle development of our cattle to improve our pregnancy rates. Some of the benefits to time AI is access to genetics from multiple, bull to multiple bulls, um, improve our herd genetics to match whatever your production needs are, whether you're looking for replacement heifers or you're just looking for um, a better feeder calf crop at the end of your season. And then also, we'll be able to own and manage full, uh, fewer bulls for our uh, within our herd. We'll also narrow our calving season, less labor for uh, more concentrated calving season. And then we'll also increase the uniform the uniformity of our feeder calves. However, not a lot of beef producers use time AI. Um, there's a lot of planning and management for time AI, and there's also a lot of cost that goes into the pharmaceuticals. Um, the drugs and treatments, whatever, for our protocols and the semen and also the labor and the technicians that go along with these protocols. One of the one things that um, my advisor actually, uh, let me borrow this uh, from his um, lessons where he wanted to look at the difference between our feeder calves at the end of our season uh, if they were bred with AI versus if they were bred uh, by our cleanup bulls that, or, they, or if they calve later on in our, our calving season. And looking at the uniformity in calf crop at the end of the year um, based off of whether or not they calved with by, uh, they calved early in the season with AI or if they were just calved later on in the season. And again, we see like the, our calf crop here is going to be larger. Calves that are uh, uh, that calves that calve within the first 21 days of our breeding season versus calves that are born three weeks later, they have approximately 35 to 50 pounds on these later calves, on these later um, calves that were born later on in the season. And also, too, one of the things I like about this diagram here, it shows that the amount of time that our cows have to regain cyclicity before the breeding season. So we're more likely to get these girls pregnant that calve early on in the season uh, because they have more time to recover from their, uh, from their um, pregnancy uh, versus these cows that have calved later on in the season. They have less time to um, get out of that anestrus and recover. So we'll have fewer calling rates from our girls that were calved, that calved with AI earlier on the season versus our girls that are calved later on in our season because they were able, because they have a higher chance of get, becoming bred back during our breeding season. But however, we do have challenges for estrus synchronization. Um, initiating a new follicular wave with that 
uh, initial GnRH treatment is a challenge for us. Uh, the ability for cattle to respond to that first GnRH shot is approximately 66% in our beef cows. Um, also, too, if they don't respond to that first GnRH shot, we can possibly induce ovulation of a small follicle at time of AI, and which can result into early pregnancy loss. Also, we have that postpartum anestrus, so that time where those cows aren't going to be ovulating. Um, you can see here this kind of this picture of um, this diagram here, postpartum anestrus and beef cows. Again, they're not going to be cycling and not going to be ovulating during this anestrus period. This is extremely variable between beef uh, herds. From 30 to 70 percent of our cows can be in anestrus before our breeding season. And this is influenced by several different factors, that uterine involution, the suckling effects from our calves, the nutritional status of our girls, uh, the presence of disease and also the parity of our animals. This is third. Is this her first calf, or this is a cow that's had five or six calves for us? Uh, those are all. All those things are going to affect whether or not uh, they're going to affect the length of her anestrus period. So possible solutions for um, our cattle being in in anestrus before the breeding season or not responding to that first generate shot. Uh, there's been a lot of research done on pre-synchronization and different protocols. Pre-synchronization is essentially the pre-treatment of cows before estrus uh, to enhance the proportion of cattle that will respond to estrus protocols, estrus synchronization protocols. Treatment with progesterone prior to the breeding season can actually enhance a cow's ability to regain estrus, so get back into cyclicity uh, just by exposing them to progesterone prior to the breeding season. Also, in, uh, when you pre-synchronize, when you um, pre-treat your animals and synchronize them before the estrus synchronization protocols, you can increase the proportion of cattle that are going to have a suitable ovarian uh, environment. Remember that low progesterone and high estradiol um, concentration circling around uh, to uh, respond to that first GnRH treatment. There's been lots of studies done on cattle that ovulate to that first generation treatment actually improve their response to the remaining treatments of synchronization protocols. So developing a pre-synchronization protocol can provide us the opportunity, I'm sorry, provide us the opportunity to maximize our ovulatory response to that GnRH and improve fertility to time AI and beef cows. So this leads me into my experiments that I've done here at OSU. Um, we utilize pre-synchronization treatments uh, in our cows to look at uh, the ovarian response, which is going to be in this first experiment, A and B. And then we then looked at the fertility and the estrus expression in our cattle with these pre-synchronization treatments. And that's going to be experiment two here. So for our first experiment, we had 52 suckled beef cows from our went from one location in Ohio during the 2021 breeding season. These cattle were blocked by postpartum interval and uh, age here. And then they were randomly assigned to these three treatments here. We have our control, which is just our six day co-sync. And then we have our PGF pre-sync, which is just a pre-sync uh, treatment of PGF 48 hours prior to the six day co-sync. And then we had the progesterone and PGF precinct group where we placed the cedar in six days prior. And then we gave her again the shot of gene or PGF here. And then 48 hours later, we synced them with the co-sync protocol. On each of these days, or just uh, on day negative nine, again, is referring to that first generate shot and cedar in. Day negative three is going to be the PGF treatment and cedar out. And then day zero is going to be the day of AI and that uh, second treatment of GnRH. So how we evaluated ovarian response is we did, uh, we did ultrasound evaluations of our cattle. Uh, each cow was scanned on uh, each day of the treatment. So every time they ran through the chute, we scanned them. And then this subset of animals, these subset of 52 cows actually had a more intense ultrasound uh, regimen here where if you look closer down to the bottom here, we scan them again on that day negative three. Um, so that's the day of PGF and cedar out. And we scan them every 24 hours in the beginning and then every 12 hours 
afterwards. And what we were looking for was the timing of ovulation, the size of the follicle on that day zero, and then we wanted to see the percentage of cattle that ovulated within treatment groups. This day seven here was used to uh, allow us to make sure that we were correct on what uh, follicle had ovulated. Um, we could see the CL had developed on that ovary of the one that we thought was um, uh, the one that had ovulated. So for my, for, so how we were able to determine this is I had to draw a lot of ovarian maps. So each day that these cattle were scanned, I drew an ovarian map um, to determine whether or not they had ovulated and what kind of structures were on their ovaries. So an example of what we would determine as ovulation to that first seeder or to that first GNRH uh, shot, we wanted, we wanted to see a CL or a follicle that was large enough to ovulate on that day negative nine, and then to see if the CL formed on that on day negative three, the next time they came through the shoot. This was an indication for us that this cow ovulated to that GNRH shot here. And then next, when we did the more intense scanning here, we looked at our follicles on present on our ovary on our ovary and when they disappeared. So every 12 hours when we scanned them, uh, we would be able to determine the hour of ovulation in our, our in our cattle. So these results um, that I'm currently going to show to you guys today are just raw is just raw data. I haven't gone through the statistical analysis for these yet, but that is coming. Um, so we for the first for this first table here, we looked at the ovulation rate to that first generate shot, where we had the control at 41.2% of them ovulated to it, the PGF group 61.1% ovulated, and then the progesterone group, we had 88.2%. And then we looked at ovulation rate after the cetal removal, so after that uh, PGF and uh, we took the cedar out, we wanted to see the amount of cattle that did ovulate. Uh, for our control, we had 88.2. For our PGF group, 100% of them ovulated. And then for the progesterone group, we had 91.1% ovulate. And then we looked at the timing of ovulation within our cows. Uh, for our control group, um, at our uh, 81, on average, um, 80, uh, uh, 81.6 hours uh, after that PGF treatment and cedar removal, our cows had ovulated uh, with plus or minus 3.4 hours. And then for our PGF group, we had 89.1% ovulate, um, not 81 point, 89.1 hours after the cedar removal, um, plus or minus three hours, they had ovulated. And then for the progesterone group, we had uh, our cattle ovulate on average at 87.8 hours. So here we wanted to look at the timing of ovulation to make sure that we were hitting our mark to when we do inseminate our cows, we're still uh, going to be able to meet that, um, have our semen go through, the, all that sperm go through that it's being prepared and being able to meet a fertile egg. And we also wanted to look at whether or not we had more control over the timing of ovulation in our groups here with a lower standard error of that 2.4 versus a 3 or 3.4. And then we looked at average diameter of the ovulatory follicle here. Again, we wanted to make sure that we had a follicle that was capable of ovulation at that time AI um, with control at 11.1 .1 millimeters, um, PGF at 12.3, and then progesterone at 12.4. We also wanted to see to make sure that we weren't inducing ovulation of those smaller follicles so that we weren't, um, so we could limit the amount of pregnancy loss based off of that size of the follicle that we induced to ovulate. And then for experiment 1B, um, we actually had a larger subset of animals for, our, for this group here. So again, we scanned our animals on each day of our treatment every time they ran through the chute. And, we, um, and this is from the four different locations in Ohio. So um, what we were looking for again was whether or not they had ovulated to that first PGF group or to that first generate shot here. However, we did not do that intensive scanning of all these cows. Up here is just the averages of our animals here for the body condition score, age, weight, and postpartum interval um, between the groups of treatments that we had for our cattle. All these cattle were 
as well, they were enrolled into each treatment group, the same sync protocols that I had showed before in the um, earlier ovarian response data. So again, I apologize, these are raw, this is raw data at the time, at this moment. So we looked at the ovulation rate, so that first generate shot. We had 59.3% of our cows in the control group ovulate, 72.1% ovulate with their PGF, and then 84.7% ovulate to that first generate shot in our progesterone group. Then we looked at ovulation follicle size. So the size of the follicles that did ovulate here um, with our control again, 13.1, PGF 13.6, and then 15.5 with our progesterone group here. And then we wanted to look at whether or not a CL was present on the ovary um, during uh, this first generate shot. Because again, that CL is going to release progesterone. Uh, we wanted to see uh, a fewer amount of animals with CLs present on that ovary to reduce that progesterone environment to that first generate shot. Um, so for control, we saw 64.9%. And then for our PGF, we had 70%. And then for our progesterone group, we actually had 35.8% here. And then we also looked at the size of the CL for our treatments. Uh, we had 20.5 millimeters for control, 17.4 for PGF, and 16.2 for our progesterone group. One of the things that we too wanted to look at with this is also the ovulation that first generate shot. It was nice to see that we were around the average of our um, of our for our control group to make sure that we had anything skewed or misleading. It's around that 66 percent. So it's it's nice to see that this is a a, a good control. Um, that it's we didn't, there's nothing special about our cows versus the other cattle um, that could be used, that could use these other treatments here, these pre-synchronization treatments here. So moving to experiment two, we went, looked at estrus expression and fertility. Um, these cattle, again, were enrolled in the same treatments here, same protocols. We had 645 cattle um, enrolled in this, uh, some, again, during the summer breeding season of 2021. We had 52.7 of those cattle were in an estrus. So again, they were not cycling uh, before these protocols were uh, administered before the breeding season. Uh, we had estrus detection patches. Uh, for We use estrus detection patches. Um, they were applied on our cattle on that PGF uh, cedar out day. So we can evaluate estrus expression of our cattle. Uh, and then on the day of AI, on that day zero, we use frozen thaw thawed semen. Um, and then on day 35, we uh, determined pregnancy using the ultrasound. And then on day 90 to evaluate uh, whether or not they kept that pregnancy from the AI pregnancy. And again, up here is just going to be our averages of our animals, our body condition score, age, postpartum interval, and weight. So for our first, uh, for our first set of results, all of this data was actually um, statistically we use uh, was analyzed and um, run through SAS. So this is actually actual data, other uh, versus using raw means. Um, so. For estrus expression and time to estrus after seed removal, we applied again those estrotech patches on our cows here. As you can see in the upper right hand corner, we scored them uh, based off of a one uh, or a zero. A zero is intact and a one is slightly rubbed off. Where it would be a two or a three, a two would be over 50% of the patch is uh, scratched off, or a three, the patch would be disappearing. Uh, is completely gone. So a two or a three would be indicative of the cow showing heat prior to time AI, uh, where if it was just a one or a zero, then that cow would have shown no heat before um, the protocol. So we did see a treatment mean looking at estrus expression here. We saw that our PGF group actually had a significant increase of uh, estrus expression. Um, it, at 83.9% versus 
versus our control and our progesterone group here. And then we had a subset of animals that we actually looked at the timing of estrus, and we did not see a treatment uh, difference between the actual timing of estrus um, <clears throat> versus other treatments. And then we looked at our pregnancies per AI at day 35. We saw a treat, we saw a, a significant difference in our progesterone group of an increase of pregnancy at 66.7% versus our other treatment groups here. <laughs> and um, where they did not have a difference between their pregnancy rates for AI, to AI. And then we have pregnancies at AI at day 90. So again, these girls in this group, they, are, they were pregnant at AI and then they kept their pregnancies at, from day 90 we saw a treatment difference for our progesterone group where we had an increased amount of cattle that kept their, that had, that were still pregnant to AI at day 90 versus our PGF and our control group. And then we looked at pregnancy loss and we did not see a significant difference between our treatment groups. Um, that's also probably due to the low number of animals uh, within these treatment groups here. Um, so it's a little hard to, to actually tell whether or not if there was a difference, a significant difference between these groups because of the low amount of animals that were in each uh, treatment group here. So for our conclusion from our results that we did actually, that we, that we did analyze, uh, we looked at um, the precinct group with the PGF, increased estrogen expression before timed AI, the progesterone precinct, improved fertility to time AI in our cows. So we had more cows pregnant with the precinct uh, with progesterone. And we didn't find any evidence within the timing of heat or pregnancy loss between our treatments. So whether or not the progesterone group helped um, increase the uh, their cows ability to regain cyclicity before the breeding season, or it allowed us to uh, time or allow them to um, response to that initial GNRH. Um, that's one thing that we're going to have to look at further within our studies. But that being said, um, thank you. And um, I want to thank the research stations at Ohio State, Eastern Jackson, and ACI, and then also my own center here in Ohio. And if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm open to answer them. Also, too, I apologize. The timing on my like thing kept my my PowerPoint. It kept on like rushing me forward, and like I didn't realize it was set on a timer. <laughs> Not a problem. Thanks, Alex. A lot of good stuff there. Um, <laughs> you know, the I think the question that comes up, you know, precincts certainly uh, a couple extra trips through the chute. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, how many more calves do we have to get to to justify the the labor and handling? But uh, there might be a question here for you. Can we stop sharing or should? Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. Was there any effect by location? By location, I wanted to look at that, uh, but location was a, a block. But um, I, I actually really do want to look at that um, with when I'm looking at the, the GNRH and other data. I, I, I can't say whether or not there was. There, there are definitely, like from just looking at the data, there was difference in our animals' body condition scores and ages and from each, um, from each facility, obviously, knowing how like some of these facilities, how we run and um, and it'll be even more interesting now that all the heifers are going to Jackson. All the young girls are going to Jackson. On the groups that you time AI, did you breed them AM and PM? Oh, so no, we, so for the time AI, everybody was done. Each, each time through the shoot was at the same time for them. So they, um, uh, they were all bred in the morning. We didn't breed off of heat. And would the number of times through the shoot have an impact on 
pregnancy rates? Yeah, that's a that's a pretty big concern, especially because our breeding season is uh, through the summer. Um, so with that being said, each cow was ran through the chute um, the same amount of times. Like so regardless, so regardless they were in the control or the PGF or the progesterone precinct, those cows were still run through the chute, if that makes sense, because I had to scan them each day, every single cow. Um, so even if so say she was in control group um and it was day 17 of the protocol or whatever um and her treatment wouldn't have started until day nine um she's still being run through the chute and being scanned so um i would say i would say no for like a treatment difference for us um however yeah i mean running your cows and stuff like that um in the summer and um, that heat stress is definitely a, a factor in in fertility for our cows, and that's why we also too when when we were working our cows, it was like it was it was like at five thirty in the morning. So we got to the farm and we started very early to beat the heat, essentially, so we can give the girls the rest of the day to to rest outside or or be able to find shade or do something during the really hot hours of the summer. So. Uh, there's a question about time AI and worming cows, if that has an impact on. I don't think so. Like, uh, I've never, um, I've, I guess you just have to read the label that I don't know if anybody's actually like, looked at that garden. I don't know if you might know that question. I mean, I've definitely, we have definitely dewormed our cows. We've definitely sprayed uh, permethrin on our cattle, we fly tag them, we do whatever we need to do, you know, when we're running these synchronization protocols. If we have our cows in the chute, we're doing as much as we can on that day. So we inhibit the, we we decrease the amount of extra times we have to work them. So I've never seen or read anything that could change that. Um, that using Cydectin or anything like that inhibits the, you know, the the use of those sync um, hormones. One of the biggest things is, I think, is, you know, when you are giving those injections, a lot of them are IM, and you want to make sure that you are um, not getting into, a, you know, a vein when you are giving that injection because you're changing, you know, the 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 amount of time that half life of that. Um, that hormone in that animal. If there's a reason why it is I am versus sub Q or versus it's um, intravenous, like within the, in the blood. So um, like, I don't know if anybody noticed that like during the, the treatment, like we do a six day protocol versus the five day protocol cosync where they do PGF um, on the day of cedar out. And then 12 hours later, they give another injection of PGF. We don't, do that. We actually just do the two PGFs that same day, the cedars out, and we make sure that they're two different injection sites. So we are um, essentially trying to make sure that that PGF is getting into into the muscle versus getting it into the vein or something like that. Certainly, uh, Alex, appreciate the logging in and sharing some of your research with us this evening. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.